It's funny, the past couple of years, it feels like a lot of people are waiting for the Jacksonville Jaguars to break out, waiting for them to really turn over a new leaf, to turn the corner, get back to respectability and relevance, and of course, all that shit didn't happen in 2016. One of the most disappointing teams in the NFL, I think, by a wide margin. You know, not the most disappointing. I think the most disappointing has to be the Carolina Panthers, then maybe the Arizona Cardinals. But the Jacksonville Jaguars are on that list. You're in a bad division. You had Blake Bortles coming off of throwing for 4,000 yards. A law firm of Allen and Allen, each of those guys had 1,000 yards receiving. You were able to get Jalen Ramsey and Miles Jack, two potential top five talents in the draft, in the same draft, and one of them in round two in Miles Jack. You're thinking to yourself, oh, God, this is year four under Gus Bradley. They've got talent. This is a team that could be exciting and feast on a bad division. And all that crap again didn't happen. For all the crap I give the Cleveland Browns for being the skid marks of the NFL, the Jacksonville Jaguars aren't far behind. And I'm sorry if that insults all 20,000 of the Jacksonville Jaguar fans in the United States, but it's true. I mean, just a lifeless, frankly, hopeless organization at this point in time. Just unbelievable. I mean, it was one thing if you didn't win the division this year. It's one thing if you didn't make the playoffs. It'd be even be one thing if you didn't finish with a 500 record, but you showed growth and you showed progress. Three and thirteen. Three and thirteen. Now, some of the optimists might sit there and say, "Well, it wasn't all bad because they lost eight games by seven points or less." So, if some of them go their way. They could potentially be nine and seven, and who knows what would have happened in the AFC South. And all that shit might be true. But if ifs and buts were candies and nuts, it'd be Christmas every day. It didn't happen. The Jaguars stink. That's why Gus Bradley was fired, and it was, frankly, long overdue. You know, But you would sit there and think, for an organization that just went through four years of Gus Bradley, and it was really, really bad, you saw your quarterback regress mightily in 2016 in his year three, which is supposed to be really the launching point year uh, for quarterbacks. That's when they're supposed to really start to piece it together, really start to figure it out. And that's when you're really supposed to be able to find out what these guys are going to be at the NFL level. He took a big step back from 2015 in a year where in 2015 he still wasn't all that good. Good fantasy numbers, but in terms of real NFL quarterback play, I think this is still a guy with more pick sixes in his career than victories as a starting quarterback. You decide you want to promote a guy who undercut Gus Bradley behind the scenes at Doug Marone, a guy who had an opportunity in Buffalo, took it for two years, went crazy all of nine and seven, of course, didn't lead the Bills to the playoffs, and then quit on the team, walked out on the team, so that way he overplayed his hand, thinking he, somebody would just have to give him a head coaching job, and they ultimately did it. This is the Doug Marone you decided to hire. Doug Marone. Instead of getting some type of big name, luring them in with a ton of money, instead of sitting there and finding a really hot big name assistant or somebody that maybe actually is worth hiring, you promote a guy from within, from a team that went 3-13. and I'm sure some Jaguars fans are going to point to the Mike Malarkey situation in Tennessee. There's one big difference of many. The Tennessee Titans have Marcus Mariota. The Jacksonville Jaguars have Blaine Gabbert 2.0 and Blake Bortles. Huge difference. Monster difference. Don't get it twisted, okay? Now, of course, the Jaguars did apparently spend big money to bring in a proven commodity NFL head coach into their organization. That was Tom Coughlin, former coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars, but he's in a role in the front office. And what he really is is he's the true de facto general manager. I don't give a shit if David Caldwell still has a general manager title. You see this happen to corporations a lot, where somebody's not doing the best of jobs, but maybe you like them, or maybe you want to give them more time. Maybe you don't feel there's better options out there. Um, you don't have somebody ready within the wings to take over. So instead of just firing the guy or demoting the guy, what you do is you say, well, you're still in charge of this at this level of management, but we need you to consult with this guy before you do anything or before any decisions are made, which ultimately means that this guy is in charge and this guy is the one that's ultimately calling the shots. This guy has to run these things through this guy. 
I equate it to what happens in the WWE. For those of you that are wrestling fans, some of you probably aren't that watch this. Some of you are, I know. It's the Triple H Stephanie factor. Stephanie's the boss's daughter. You throw Shane in there. Shane is the boss's daughter. God is the son-in-law. Boning Stephanie. Making breakfast club daughter babies. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what Triple H is in charge of, or Stephanie, Stephanie is in charge of, or Shane McMahon is in charge of. There is only one guy that is the decision maker in the WWE, and that is Vince McMahon. At the end of the day, because of a lack of trust and poor leadership with an inability to delegate, Vince has to have final say-so on everything. No matter what a Dave Meltzer or other wrestling leader or other wrestling people try to tell you, Vince still has his hands in everything. Every decision rolls through him, directly or indirectly. So it doesn't matter if you say this guy is in charge of talent or this guy's in charge of this. The guy that's really in charge is still Vince McMahon. And with what the Jaguars did here, Tom Coughlin is the one calling the shots. Tom Coughlin is the general manager. I don't give a fuck what anybody else wants to say. I don't give a shit what anybody in the Jaguars organization says. This reeks of that type of move, and that's exactly what it is. And frankly, that's what it needs to be. Because David Caldwell is just not cutting the mustard, not getting the job done. You need somebody that knows what the hell they're doing. Now, does Coughlin know what he's doing from a front office standpoint? Eh, I don't know. This is a guy with a good track record in the NFL, made the Jaguars a respectable for expansion franchise, and won two Super Bowls with the New York Giants. So it's worth a shot. And this team does need a shot. They need a shot in the arm. They need to figure out what's going on with Blake Bortles. 22 turnovers in 2016. Um major regression from year two to year three, and he wasn't all that great in 2015 when his numbers were better. I mean, this is a team that's about to be sunk with a failed first-round pick at the quarterback position. It sunk them when they missed on Blaine Gabbert. It's about to sink them even worse when they miss on Blake Bortles. Unbelievable. But it's more than just that. You look at offensively, you know, Bortles' struggles weren't alone. He had no running back or over 500 yards. Uh, Yeldon didn't show he could take over the job full-time. Chris Ivory couldn't stay healthy much, and when he did, he wasn't very good. Uh, the law firm of Allen and Allen really struggling after go both going over 1,000 yards last season. Hearns missed several games with injuries. Robinson didn't look nearly the same in 2016. Doesn't help when your quarterback sucks. And none, neither one of them got to 1,000 yards receiving. In fact, it was Marquise Lee, their second-round pick for 2014, who was second on the team in receptions and receiving yards. Uh, but, you know, a defense that had some talent added in free agency like Malik Jackson in the draft with guys like um, the past couple of years in Dante Fowler and Yannick Ngakwe and Jalen Ramsey and Miles Jack, but their defense still has a long way to go. This is a Jaguars organization that really needs a kick in the ass, really needs something. It's a team that should be better than it is in theory, but maybe they are exactly who the fuck they are. Uh, when you look at the 2016 draft, though, you know, I opined after that draft, I felt that this was the type of draft that could potentially be the thing that was the turning point. And this is the type of draft that you have that should win you a division with, by the second year of the draft class. You got Jalen Ramsey, the fifth overall pick. Thought he had a great year. Not a ton of ball skills, but a great cover guy. Uh, Miles Jack in round two. You know, let's see what he does another year in the NFL. Yannick Ngakwe, you know, I thought he was outstanding for them as a pass rusher in 2016. I thought he was so overrated uh, coming into the draft out of Maryland. You know, because when I saw him in the Big Ten, when he went up against some of the bigger name offensive linemen, I thought he ate their lunch consistently. And I'm not surprised that he's playing well at the NFL level. You know, those three guys all have difference-making potential on the defensive side of the ball with Jalen Ramsey, Miles Jack, and Yannick Ngakwe. I mean, you're talking about three guys that could be difference makers, three guys that could be the building block for this defense for years to come. This defense should be better, and frankly, this team should be better. And now it's up to Tom Coughlin, uh, Dave Caldwell, Doug Marone to make this team better. They're in a good position in salary cap, and they seem to be almost every year. Part of it is because they draft so poorly, they don't have to re-sign a ton of their guys. Um and while they go out and spend big in free agency the past couple of years, uh, they still leave themselves with a bunch of money on the table. You know, they have questions. Do you re-sign Luke Jokel? Probably not. Do you re-sign Jonathan Cyprian? Probably. Do you re-sign Denard Robinson, Avery Jones? You know, the funny thing is, in terms of the priorities for this team, I think the number one priority in terms of guys to re-sign 
is probably Avery Jones in terms of guys that are pending free agents. And then maybe Cyprian. Jokel, you can let go. Uh, Denard Robinson, you won't miss. Uh, but then it's not just that in terms of the money. You, know, you could talk about targeting guys at free agency. But at this point in time, I don't know that the Jaguars need to do that much either. Because you continue to do that, you're never going to get past a certain point. you got to build your team through the draft. You can't continue to try and bring in big guys in free agency to make up for your draft failures. Uh, but they've got decisions to make in terms of contracts for the guys from the 2014 class. Blake Bortles, do you pick up his fifth-year option? Do you go ahead and try and re-sign him to a long-term deal and pray to God that it works out? If you do that, you're crazy. Uh, Marquise Lee, Allen Robinson, Brandon Linder, Telvin Smith. You, know, you throw Telvin Smith into that mix with Ramsey, Jack, and Ngakwe. I mean, there's some talent on the defensive side of the ball. Young talent. Throw Dante Fowler in there. He wasn't great as a in his um, effectively rookie season in 2016. But coming off of a major knee injury, you hope he's going to be better in 2017. You, know, you got to figure out what you're going to do with these guys. I'd assume you want to go ahead with some of that money you have freed up instead of going crazy in free agency. You want to keep guys like Avery Jones and keep guys like Jonathan Cyprian and lock up guys like Allen Robinson, Marquise Lee, Telvin Smith long term. That's what a smart organization would do. Some of the talent that you do have, you don't want to let it go because God knows you're lucky to get some of the talent that you have because you usually don't know what the hell you're doing in the draft any damn ways. So why the hell would you want to lose them? And it's that simple. In terms of the draft, it's one of these things for the Jaguars. You know, they have holes and they have needs, but it's about quality more than quantity. That's what's going to be important. Like in 2016, I thought they hit really big on the quality aspect. Won a ton of players, but the guys that they got were pretty damn good. Uh, that's what they need again. You know, yet another year that they're picking in the top five of the draft. Imagine that. Um, but you've got picks in all seven rounds, you know, I don't know if they need to draft seven players. Um, probably be better off if they could get four or five guys and maybe get four picks in the first two days of the draft. That's kind of what I'd be angling for if I were the Jaguars. Their number one draft need is quarterback position because Blake Bortles stinks and everybody should just own up to it and accept it. But they're not going to take one in round one for sure. Um, should they potentially take one in round three? Oh, absolutely. Because you want to find out what Bortles has got in him. Is he going to have that fire up his ass to compete? And is he going to get pissed off and play better because you drafted a guy in the third round who could potentially take over down the road? You know, somewhere on day two, I think the Jaguars do need to explore taking a quarterback because I don't know if anything else is going to get Bortles to play better. So why not try this? And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, then maybe you got a guy that could replace Blake Bortles and hopefully play better. Um, after that, their number one need is running back. They have to be able to run the ball better. You're sitting there at pick four. Is it Leonard Fournette territory for them? I don't think that Leonard Fournette is worth a top five pick, but for the Jacksonville Jaguars and for their team and for what Fournette could bring to the table, I would be okay with them taking him fourth overall. He could have an Ezekiel Elliott type of impact for them in 2017. He could. I still think they could use another quality pass rusher. Um, you know, Fowler and Ngakwe are there, but I think they could use a base end. So a guy like Son Solomon Thomas is going to make a lot of sense if he is there at pick number four. Now, personally, if I'm choosing between Fournette and Solomon Thomas, I'm probably leaning towards Fournette for the Jaguars. Because it goes beyond just team need. It goes beyond impact and the ability to impact everything that the team does. Solomon Thomas is a stud, period. And I expect him to be a stud at the NFL level. But the most he's going to really help you do is improve your pass rush and really improve your run defense. Leonard Fournette could improve your running game. He could improve your passing game. He can improve your run blocking because sometimes he's not going to need great blocking. He can improve your pass protection because teams are going to be a little hesitant to come streaming up the field in less than obvious passing situations because they'll be afraid Fournette's going to run through him and right by him. He can impact uh, their run defense and their pass defense by keeping the Jaguars' defense fresh and off the fucking field. So when you look at it, in this draft, they need an impact running back. If it's not Fournette in round one, and they think with this really good running back class, it's worth it more to take Solomon Thomas in round one 
and take a running back around two or three, and then they take a young quarterback somewhere along the way, maybe an interior offensive lineman late in day two, early day three, then this could potentially be another good draft for the Jacksonville Jaguars and the type of draft that, in theory, should help this organization turn the corner. Help them win the division some point in time soon. But at the end of the day, if Blake Bortles doesn't work out, frankly, all this talk is for naught because none of it freaking matters and the Jacksonville Jaguars are back to square one again.